this uh, this uh, meeting of the urban. I'm a little off out of sorts. Hold on one second. I'll catch up. Meeting of the Urban Forestry Commission, uh, January fifth, twenty twenty two. The meeting is being recorded, as you all know. Uh, public comment period. Um, there was a guest, uh, Violet. I see that Violet is here. Does Violet have anything to? Would you like to introduce yourself? I think David's Violet. Oh yeah. Oh. I'm sorry, my my daughter I think messed with my screen here. So <laughs> all right, okay, Violet. Thank you, Violet. <laughs> all right, so that solves that. So, good thing I pressed that button. I was reluctant because it said Violet, and I'm not sure who it is. <laughs> um, I know David, your code name is Violet. We're good. <laughs> oh, come off it. Yeah. Um okay, so I sent you a set of minutes. Moving on, there's no one else from the public here. Moving on, I sent you all a set of minutes from the, our last 12-15 meeting earlier today, this afternoon. I'm not sure if you had time to read them. Yeah, I didn't get it. Only part way. Okay, so take your time. Uh, the 12-16 minutes, I'm still listening to the recording. Uh, I'm halfway done with the minutes, so my apologies. But I have Sue and David here. So when we talk about the STO, hopefully between the three of us, we'll remember everything that was discussed. Oh, you're on camera, Sue. Oh, sorry. It's all right. No one seeing it, though. I have a correction to make. Can you hear me, Deb? I can, Molly. Thank you. Okay. Under that section on native plants and pollinators, mm -hmm. um, it said she has been looking at plantings in Turner's Falls. I haven't looked at the plantings. I what I said was that I thought it would be a good idea to look at the plantings to assess the validity of concerns. Blah blah blah. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
I'm done. The rest of you are muted. I'm done. Okay, I'm done. Jen's done. How about, how about Violet? I'm done too, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm being a wise guy. Uh, all right. Uh, anyone else have any other comments? No, okay. Um, we get a motion to accept the minutes as amended. I will. And it's Molly with a sue your a second. I'll second. Okay, thank you. Um, Deb, can you call a roll call, please? I can. Rich? Oh uh, yes. Jen? Yes. Susan? Yes. Rob? Yes. Molly? Yes. And David? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, so tree warden and chair report. Um, I don't really have any, I have a couple things to report about. I don't do more, more about the tree warden aspect of things. So the Mass Tree Wardens and Foresters uh, annual conference has been moved for to completely virtual. We're not going to meet in person. That decision was made last, last week. So I will send you a link while we're meeting if you're interested in going to any of those things. Um, I believe there is a level of a discount because you, you would fall under my membership. So if you're interested in anything, let me know. Um, it is I said, going to be virtual. Um, I have um, the uh, new uh, seedling list, which I actually am going to do a screen share with you so you can see it. Find where I can do that. Okay, can everyone see that list? Yes. I can, oh, that's too much. Hold on a second. So this year we're offering blue spruce, white spruce, stug fir, white oak, tulip poplar, pin oak, bald cypress, ginkgo, service berry, lilac, chinkapin oak, American sweet gum, red mulberry, and Washington hawthorn. Uh, plus the pre-bagged seedlings, Fraser fir, white spruce, balsam fir, and canon fir. So I will also send this out to you so if you can look this over and you uh, folks have any suggestions about what they like to order, I'd love to hear from you. Um, if you want to order more than the, the normal 500 uh, and you think we can um, give, them, give them away in two days or three days time, that would be fine as well. So. Do we usually order 500 per species? Uh, 500 total, usually 100 per species that we yeah. is the minimum. Um, and I think last year, Sue, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but last year I think we gave away the we gave away everything. We didn't have a thing left. Yep. So it's possible that uh, we could give away more this year. And I've tried to adjust. I'm responsible for the ceiling program. If you don't remember that, but I tried to adjust it, um, the seedlings themselves actually to sort of be a mix of, um, uh, you know, con conifers, hardwoods, um, and hardwoods are overstory and understory trees. Mm -hmm. uh, encourage people to actually plant a uh, different uh, variety of trees across the state, but also based upon our experiences with um, of the, some of these tree species and how they actually do in our environment. So. I will send that to you as well. Uh, I, I don't, I have potentially um, one. Um, hey, Marilyn. Hello. Welcome. Sorry, have, I'm a little late. I had a work delay. That's okay. We're all good. We, we, we approved the minutes of the last meeting. So um, you have them in your inbox if you would like to read them. Yep. Uh, I potentially might have one request for public shade tree hearing at the end of Harrison Avenue. Uh, there is a tree that is very close to someone's driveway um, that could be considered a, um, a sightline hazard because of its size. 
So I'm working with them to try to mitigate it so we don't have to have a public shade tree hearing, but I think they would like to have a public shade tree hearing. So um, if, um, if one, we have one, it won't be until, probably not till after our second meeting of this month. So I will let you know. Um, on that list of trees for Arbor Day, when do we have to decide that? Um, this, you know, the, the sooner the better. That's why I want to send it to you today. Mm -hmm. I mean, we should probably think about ordering or at least holding because some of those, so there's 30,000 seedlings that are reserved for this whole program. And that's a mix of all those seedlings that are on that list. Some of them I have in lots of 2,000. Other ones I only have lots of 1,000 just because the availability this year was really off the wall. Um, I realize, I, I, real, I should know this by now with the uh, getting tree stock for us in Northampton, it's the same thing for seedling stock. It's really difficult. Um, and you have to get this really early in the fall and hold a reserve. And then of course, they're not sure that they're gonna be able to have the reserve just because of climate and weather conditions, et cetera. So um, if we could, if you could turn this around, cause this will be delivered, uh, this will be sent out in a mailing to about 1300 different people. And it will be uh, put up at Mass Tree Warden and Foresters over the weekend on their website. So mm -hmm. the better. I'll, I'll get it out to you. Today. Should we just get back to you individually, like sort of with what we think sure. would yep. be the best choices? Yep. Rich, I, I have a question. Is, is blue spruce Colorado blue spruce? Is that the same thing? Uh, yes. Yep. So we wouldn't probably want to plant those then. No. No, they're popular and people, I mean, I, last year we sold out, of, I had 1,500, they were gone in like three weeks. Hmm. So people are still planting them. Um, they so, don't do well here? Um, well, th they are susceptible to rhizosphyria, oh. which, uh, basically a, a soil-borne fung fungal pathogen that just de devastates the trees. I mean, they still use them in a lot of screenings and plantings because they did they grow pretty well, but then they just reach a point where they all get infected and they oh. get sick, unfortunately. Um, Are there other trees on that list that aren't suitable for our area? Like, what about bald cypress? I was surprised to see that. No, everything on there is suitable. We, we, we plant a lot of bald cypresses ourselves. So they're very salt tolerant. Uh, oh, wow. I tried to get some metasequoias actually, but I, they were all sold out. Uh, By the way, regarding bald cypress, uh, my hairdresser is on Main Street and one of the city trees had to be removed because it wasn't doing well. And she found it kind of humorous that the, that the tree that was planted in its place was a bald cypress. <laughs> yeah, I've planted quite a few of those and I've uh, robbed pruning one that I planted, I think like 15 years ago. Uh, and they seem to do really well. Um, they're very tolerant of the urban environment. It's pretty, mm -hmm. um, and they're a beautiful tree. But I tried to match what I thought, you know, I'm doing a bunch of research of what trees were, would work well in our environment, but also provide some underwire plantings. Lilacs, I know, are not typically an under, underwire planting, but people really like them because they flower. Um, and they, we, sell, we sell out of those every year. Um, so, so that's the list. And we also changed it a little bit because we wanted to include um, Earth Day. So typically it's always been an Arbor Day seedling program. But, you know, we're, as we all know from our own uh, Arbor Day celebration, we are always talking about how it coincides with Earth Day or, or, um, or Climate Week. So we wanted to try to change the brochure a little bit to try to reach out to other schools, uh, other environmental groups that might be interested especially with young people, because we're just trying to capture as many young people as we can, um, just to make them, just to reach out to them to make a connection, because they're out there and they're out, they're thinking about the environment like we are, but they, they don't necessarily know or um, know how to, um, you know, make an impact or connect with people that can make an impact. So, so those are really the two things that I have, or the three things I have, the hearing, um, the tree wardens conference got changed, and <coughs> the Arbor Day season uh, brochure. Um, okay, anyone have any questions?
Is there another set of minutes that we're supposed to approve? They're 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 in a draft and they're not completed. Um, okay. Those are for the subgroup, which is Sue, Sue, um, myself, and Violet. So, sorry, David. <laughs> David, you can change that name anytime. If I'm driving you crazy. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, if I would, I could. I, <laughs> if I could, I would. Okay. All right. Uh, so our next order of business is the year-end planting report. So um, I kind of said year-end planting report, but I, it's not like an official report, but I will share with you uh, what I have so far. Hold on one second. Yeah, which one it's on now. Seedling committee. Hold on one second. Sorry. That's one. Okay. Can <laughs> list. Or just fix it. Hold on one second. Okay. So I've been pouring over. This is the master list um, that is part of that whole large spreadsheet that um, that we started probably about five or five or six years ago. Um, and this is this is the trees that we planted uh, this year. So I have a total of two hundred and ninety eight. Um, but I'm, I'm off by probably probably 10 or so. Uh, I'm trying to reconcile a list that Rob sent me today. Um, but this is, and I think I kind of showed this to you briefly at the last meeting, but this is how the data of all the new trees, how it's kept, um, prior to it being dumped in a tree keeper, which it hasn't been. So this, this is... Um, you know, and here's like a, a tally sheet on the side over here, which is tree plants in 2021. So at the top, it says 298 trees. And then you can scroll down by species. So for example, in that line there, we, you know, um, we planted 10 uh, clad rest is Kentucky. Uh, we planted a lot of Kentucky coffee trees this year, 16 of them. Um, 17 Emerald City tulips. And then it breaks it down um, even a little further. It breaks it down by total by street. So if we were to scroll down to, um, sorry, I'm giving you a headache, but hold on one second. Mm -hmm. All right. uh, Monroe Street, so there's 16 there. That, that reflects the, um, neighborhood tree, part of the neighborhood tree planting program. Um, I don't have it broken down by neighborhood tree planting program. This is just trees we planted over the whole, um, the whole year. And this tells you by street. Another one is uh, industrial drive circle. There's 15 plus uh, in industrial drive itself. So you can see that we've planted upwards of 50 trees um, on, on the, in the industrial drive stretch, which actually really was had no trees. Um, it's unfortunately not very walkable because there's no sidewalks, but hopefully when they go to do industrial drive over, which they will probably have to in the next five years, they will include sidewalks. So we were very careful to make sure that we planted them within the public right of way, but not in a place where the sidewalks, uh, the new sidewalks would impact them. Mm. Um, given the, what. Well, the situation ran into a Warfield place. So, and then it breaks it down a little further by um, total by location. So, 214 trees were planted in the tree belt, 35 trees were planted at setbacks, um, 16 trees were planted at the Bridge Street Cemetery, um, borderline trees, nine borderline trees are trees that are considered to be on the very edge of the public right of way private property. 
Uh, the two that were planted in the parking lot were planted with the replacement trees at the, um, at the senior center in their parking lot. And the reason that I have them set up designated that way is because that is in line with the data, how the data is kept in TreeKeeper and how they're identified by location. Um, the right-of-way trees would be um, the trees that are inside industrial circle because that really is not a park. That is actually uh, a, a piece of the public right-of-way. Uh, and then to distill a little further, we breaks it down by um, total by planting type. So 78 bare root, 14 B&B, &B, uh, 205 grow bag, and one container. Uh, Rich, are the trees that we dug up and then planted in there? Um, we might bare root. Yeah, no, Rob, you mean the ones that we did over on um, King Street? Yeah, those are those are now listed as hold on industrial drive. Yeah, right here. So if you look uh, in line 90, 106 industrial drive is a London plane tree. Okay, they're bare root, classified yeah. as bare root. Yep. Right, uh, but it's mo it was moved. They were moved from King Street. So okay. I got it. Um, can, this might not be an easy question, but I'm just curious, Rob and Rich. Um, as far as species and so forth, is there anything you can point out that's sort of new this year or consistent with past years? I see a lot of the same trees we've been planting, but also it looks like there are some species that I don't remember planting prior in previous years. Yeah, so we, we I don't think we've planted uh, hardy rubber trees before. And so that's, you know, an opportunity. We'll hopefully it'll go well. And uh, we put enough of them out so that we're it's probably a reasonable experiment. See how they do. What's the scientific name for those? Uh, it's right there, Mom, right in the screen. Echomedes. Eucomia? Eucomia, yeah. 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 It was identified as one of the uh, desired tree plantings, and um, I saw it actually in the um, Citizen Forester newsletter that Molly Freilicher put together. Yeah. Hmm. I don't and think. The, uh, and I think the other big thing that, that happened that we did in numbers this year is that we've got, uh, we've had available. Um, a scaled down sized uh, cultivar of the tulip tree. And so it's very difficult to plant tulip trees uh, because they're so big, there's not many places to put them, but, but now there's Emerald City tulip trees. And I think that might be new for this year. And that allows us to plant them uh, pretty easily, in many places. Rich, does this planting include the trees that were installed at the round uh, Round building parking area. No. No, these not, trees, no, these trees are the trees that we we contracted and purchased and planted with our own forces between the EPW and um, volunteers. Mm -hmm. Those actually that's actually that's actually a good point. I um, I really can't, I guess I can't really quantify off the top of my head, trees that were planted by other construction projects that were either done by other city departments or um, development projects that were, you know, um, had passed through the planning board. So technically, the city might, the city has more trees newly planted than what's on this list because of those other situations. Yes. Mm -hmm. And and do we know, um, I'm just curious, it's yeah. an impressively long list. Um, do, do we know about how many that have been planted since our inception have, have not made it? Like what percentage? Uh, so I, I, you know, if that's a good, that's a good question. I would say probably 95% of the trees, 92 to 95% of the trees have made it. I, we're, we're definitely above 90. That's an amazing percentage. I just, yeah. from a person who's been in this industry a long time, that is like crazy. And I think it speaks to, um, 
you know, just the quality of the plantings, you know, the crews that are trained and are showing back up and, and uh, the sighting of the trees and also the, um, you know, kind of unbelievable effort on the DPW to water them. Because um, that's like, and the fact that we're not using ball and burlap trees. So I, um, I the other thing I just want to say quickly is the species diversity truly is amazing. I mean, this is not typical of, of what you're going to see in a town or even from a, you know, landscape company. I mean, this is, this is uh, just, you know, incredible. And um, um, I'll chime in too. You mentioned that we're not using ball and burlap, but there's also a lot of attention. Rob has, especially I think, and Rich have been putting in, and I think Alicia too, have been putting into finding good stock because you know, we've often talked about how, how nice it would be to just decide, oh, we're going to plan on planting this many, this type trees and that many, that type trees. But to be able to find the stock has always driven us kind of so that you've identified all of these diverse species in stock that can survive. That's pretty impressive. I just want to point out that in column N, it, there's, you can see replacement occasionally. And that gives you an idea. We, we, we replaced a lot of trees this year compared to other years. And you can see where it says replacement gives you an idea of how many trees had to be replaced. You know, non-survival. Oh, one other thing I just, I just remembered something I wanted to say about the, um, the planting at like the, uh, at the industrial drive, um, you know, just going forward, um, you know, we might just think all oh, those are street trees or something, but by populating that area a lot, you know, we're kind of moving towards an, uh, an opportunity of, um, you know, having, even though it's not a super walkable place and you're not gonna have tons of pedestrians, but it can be, you know, in a pocket of urban forest, you know, in the future, which is gonna be vital to air pollution mitigation and, you know, many other things. So, um, and cooling, you know, a, a big pocket of trees can affect, you know, several miles around it, you know? So I just, you know, this is incredible, you know? Yeah, it's, pre it's pretty impressive. When I was doing this, um, the way this table works is that uh, I cannot enter any, uh, over here, for example, where it says uh, like Bridge Road. If uh, we've never planted any trees on Bridge Road, when I go to enter Bridge Road in this column, it won't let me. So I have to scroll over to this column and actually physically enter um, Bridge Road right here. And there's an associated formula um, up in the upper, in this column right here. As, long, as well. So I, I had to enter so many new streets that we've planted on, we've never planted before, that I was, I, was, I was actually getting a little frustrated, not because we did this nice job, but because I had to keep stopping and fix the spreadsheet so it would calculate correctly. Um, it, is a, it, is an impressive, uh, it is an impressive list. I mean, I think we're probably roughly up around 200, uh, 325. I just have to finish reconciling it. And I'll have it done completely for the next meeting. But um, and then I've got to try. I want to merge this. Um, I want to slide another column over here. Um, actually, if, uh, go just for a second, not to give you a headache. Uh, so this list here, which is not as polished, this list here. Um, Gives you classification, uh, the species type, and the ward. So what I'm hoping to do is, in our list, is to actually take this little ward column right here and take this and put it in um, over here. So we would have another column that would have the ward. 
So it would tell you, you know, how, how many reward we planted. Yeah. And then we can take that metrices and apply it to our original, um, our original sheet, um, which is back here. Oh, where is that? I was trying to find that document. Where so th this that? document, this document is my in my drive, and I haven't released it because it's I have to clean it up before I let you have it. Oh, well, case. isn't I recognize that because I created that spreadsheet. Isn't Correct. that on our drive, or or did you move it, Rich? I so I this was on. You have this in our original communication in whatever Google format that. You, we were using in the beginning, but this has been converted to an Excel spreadsheet. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not gonna convert it back into a Google doc because the formulas that are in the back end of this, this, this whole uh, sheet will get messed up. So it's gonna have to be kept as a, um, at least for me, for tracking purposes, got to be kept as an Excel sheet. Mm -hmm. um, and then we had, you know, so basically what I would like to do mm -hmm. is, um, better understand where we're at ward wise. Um, and that's a priority for me to get that done so we can see how we're doing um, over the last right. years ward planting. The problem is, is that the list doesn't talk to each other very well. So it's kind of a manual drag and drop. Right. Um, can you show that page that was there a second ago? Sure, the uh, priority zones? Yes. Sure. Yep. Yeah, that's the one. Um, yeah, I wanted to at some point see if we could look at this and see, you know, wh what actually was planted and whether it matches up with how well it matches up with what we were trying to do. Yeah, this is probably going to have to get cleaned up. This tab will have to get squared away because there's all these little. Uh, when it got transferred from a Google Sheet to a Excel, it got all goofed up. Is the Google Sheet still on our drive? It is, yep. What's it called? I couldn't find it. Uh, I don't know, I'll, I'll have to do some homework. I, I, okay. I'm pretty sure it's in there. If not, in, if not, it's a shared, it's a shared document that we all have access to. Uh -huh. Actually, Lily, I think, or Marilyn might have been the original owners because they right. were the ones that used to edit it. Yeah. So, um, you know, and here's a, a EJ tab that we had. Uh, community, you know, community node lists. So that this this front end of this document hasn't changed. That does exist, and you all have access to it. Mm -hmm. but I think it's in a Google Sheet. This is now an Excel. Well, if you wouldn't mind checking in our shared folder, because I can't, yep. I don't see it there. No. Yep. No, it's, it's not going to be in there. Where it is, is if you go to your, if you have a Google Drive. Yeah, I'm in there now. Okay, and you go to, uh, on the left-hand column, it's going to say things shared with me. Oh, okay. So if you look through there, you will find it because it was shared with all of us. Oh, okay. Not under shared drives. No, no, it's ah. under shared with me. So um, okay, okay. I shared it with us. It should be there. All right. So I'll have... Um, this will be done, but this is basically what, you know, this is what this kind of looks like and where we're at. I think we've, we've done a lot of, uh, done a lot of planting. Oh, I found it. Okay. We have, did you say we, did we have a, a ballpark total since we started? When was that? Uh, uh, we're pretty close to 2000. Wow. Uh, since, and that's been two, since 2016? 2000. 15. 2000, that's a lot of trees. 2015, because the commission had its first meeting in May of 2015, and we planted, I think, like 112 trees that fall. Hmm. Seems yeah. to have gone from 1,000 to 2,000 really fast, even with the pandemic. I mean, when you when you ramp up when you ramp up plantings, um, you know, for example, uh, let me just see if I can, uh, you know, here's a here's a here's the water. This is a water bag list, but in actuality, it's the tree planting list. I just had to change it because I 
when I first started doing this, this was, I had to print this out and actually physically hand this to the, to Brooke and Gerardo or Abby, whoever was doing the water. Now, since then we have, we have, they have tablets, which are LTE enabled. So they can actually look this all up online, right. uh, which makes our, my life a lot easier. And then they can actually, Brooke can actually go along and if there's a problem with the tree, she makes a note with it. And then I get notified there's a note in there and then I have to go deal with it or she deals with it herself. But, but here's an example of um, 2019, you know, we planted 400 and, uh, 454 trees. Wow. So last year we planted, you know, this year it was 2021, really, we planted, you know, 320. So there's, you know, there's almost half the lift right there. Um, wow. You know, in 2018, we planted 294. Uh, I see. So it was that huge year, yeah, 2019, yeah, yeah. right yeah. before the pandemic. Right. And then in 2017, we planted 248. Um, and then um, this, this list doesn't work that way. It's not been, what well, it did. Actually, it's 109. So, which I think is actually probably not correct, but I... I, we're so we're very very close to 2,000 trees, which is, you know, as we've I said before, it's about 20% of our. That's 20% of our stated inventory, um, in in uh, tree keeper. So that 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 that's a lot to do in, in a short period of time. But, Sorry, Rich, if you already said this. Um, okay, is, is this spreadsheet that you're sharing? Is is this in our? Google Drive or no. Is it, no, okay. No, this is a master sheet that I'm trying to alter. And before I release it, I want to I want to make sure that it's correct. Okay. Because I really I need help from uh, Beth Willard. She's the one that put this together. I need a little help from Beth Willard to she needs to explain to me how she was able to merge the wards because that's kind of important. We need to have that ability to distill that down. Um, because I also think that's sort of helpful too when we're looking at um, the different um, planting location um, information that was generated by, by Molly and all the other commissioners that walked everywhere. Because that's kind of, I think, where, what we're gonna, you know, where we're, where we're gonna have to go is we're gonna have to look at those locations that were selected and then distill that a little further down um, to see if we can actually plant in groups group of uh, groups of trees in a location in a particular ward because we're deficient in one ward versus the other ward. The other thing that this doesn't reflect either is, um, you know, we didn't, we didn't plant all the trees um, that we wanted to in our EJ grant that we applied for. So we still have um, a follow-up leg on the EJ aspect of things. So we, we did plant some, but it was just mainly around the bottom of Crafts Avenue and right before the Roundhouse parking lot entrance. So we still have, um, I don't know, Rob, how many trees do you think? Maybe 20? Yeah, and we also remember we did that uh, dead end street um, off of, um, off of uh, yeah, well, uh Yeah, we did Wilson Avenue. So Wilson, Wilson Avenue, that was 10 trees too, I think. So. Yeah, so, so we planted probably half of the, e identified EJ places. Right. We, we'd like to finish that up in the spring as well. So I, this is, this is, this is what we have. And then uh, I had a little conversation with Rob earlier, but we got, we got cut off, unfortunately. Um, we need to reach out to the nurseries that are, uh, that we've been using and see what kind of availability they have of, uh, uh, of different, uh, tree species. So I sent an email to John at Amherst Nursery, and then uh, I'm going to send an email to uh, Chestnut Ridge Nursery to uh, see if what they have uh, for a spring availability list for bare root. And um, as Rob alluded to in our conversation is that we are, you know, Rob, and I, Rob, you can speak to this, but I'll just briefly say that Rob went to Amherst Nursery prior to the holiday and walked around, and a lot of the trees that John had standing um, that we normally would tag and purchase for the spring um, were either um, too small because they were just 
transplanted this fall. Um, the type of species, so for example, sweet gums, um, which we're looking more Kentucky coffee trees. Um, we're, you know, we're not, they're not available. So we may have to lean a little more heavier on the bare root plantings. That's which, right. If, you know, we would have to do probably instead of, you know, 40 bare roots in the spring and 40 in the fall, we're looking at 60 in the spring, six, 70 in the spring, and then another 70 uh, to 80 in the fall to get that mix because the bare root availability seems to be better for uh, species diversity. So those are just all things we have to look at. So, I mean, I don't have any, um, I don't have any answers about what tree stock we were gonna have available for um, this spring yet until we have a little better understanding of what's available from the nurseries. Anybody have any questions? Okay. Wow, you guys are awfully quiet. Well, one question I have, if it hasn't already been addressed, is sure. um, you know, Sue alluded to um, our hundredth tree planting, and and we had some press coverage, mm -hmm. um, and we missed the two thousand due to the pandemic. Um, might might there be an opportunity? this year to, to highlight all that we've accomplished since the thousandth uh, planting? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I, don't see, I don't see why not. I mean, I don't, I have to do all the math to figure out and I have to tally up the finish of this year to make sure that we actually are not, we may not be at the 2000th tree, we might be very close. So this spring for sure will push us over if we're not. Why not? But yes, I would agree with you. And I think it would be, and you know, this is just a thought, maybe it would be dovetailed into the um, Arbor Day or, or Climate Week, Arbor Day slash Earth Day yeah. Climate Week um, as a press release from the mayor's office. And again, I know um, former Mayor Narkowitz was such a huge supporter of this program. Um, so maybe this is a way to have a, you know, invite Jean Louise, our new mayor, to help us come celebrate that, have continuity. Yeah, I think so. From my understanding, she's very supportive of the tree program and um, mm, that's our, important. Our, funding, our funding mechanism, as far as I know, is gonna stay in place just the way it is. Um, Right, because it is it is budget time, and Donna's been working on the budget, so um, they are uh, requesting budget input from all department heads. But we'll probably have a little better picture of the budget scenario at the end of January. But I don't see anything changing um, at the moment for us, so I think we can continue to anticipate that we will be funded at the level we've been funded in the last couple of years. Well, One other quick question, Rich. Again, yes. sorry, this has already been brought up. Um, because of all the controversy around the removal of those cherry trees, mm -hmm. is, is there um, a plan in place for something there to help uh, not only appease the neighborhood, but ensure that there is uh, greenery? Yeah, so there are, uh, I want to say 16 trees that are going to be replaced there. I think it's 16. Um, and they, you know, Warner Brothers put all of the uh, structural soil in the ground and they did a temporary, uh, temporary sidewalks and temporary driveway aprons. Um, they're going to come back in the spring and take the temporary asphalt out and put in the flexi pave uh, in between the driveways uh, where the CU soil is. Mm -hmm. And then we can, act, and they did put a, a, a probably I think a foot or foot and a half of uh, high quality loam in the tree belts where the CU soil is. So we, they will end up um, we'll end up planting in there. So my goal is to um, is to reach out to the residents um, 
probably sometime this winter, probably in February, to have a discussion about planting. Um, and I and I don't know if I want to meet with them in person or I want to meet with them on Zoom. I, I haven't quite figured out how I want to go about this yet. But yes, I want to do some public outreach because um, I have them be part of the planting process as long as as well as uh, the rest of the commissioners and. Um, you know, volunteers, any volunteers, and specifically volunteers in Trino Camden. Well, will that be with the intention of um, helping them or, or allowing them to select trees, or do you already have a, do you already have a, a species in mind? No, I, I don't have a species in mind, and the reason I don't is because I don't have, I don't have any raw data from the nurseries as to what's available. So, I, you know, I have to give them a selective, a, sele a, a uh, selection to choose from as long as it's within our tree list and planting guidelines um, and then we, we can go from there we i think this came up in a prior meeting and because publicly one of the advocates for the trees one of the activists said they wanted i don't know 20 foot trees or 25 foot trees and we had a conversation about how actually younger trees are better. And, um, and we discussed how that maybe there's an educational component to it. So, so, uh, so Sue, one of the good things is that they were asking for that as part of their lawsuit, which got dismissed. So I think the 20 foot tree requirement probably went away with the lawsuit. I hope. Yeah, I hope they can understand that, you know, that's not really what they want, <laughs> yes. you know, if they want healthy trees, yeah, which I know they do because they care. Are gonna do. Um, yeah. So I have a question, Rich. Um, this is a big, big moment, I think, for the city of Northampton because I think it's the first project of that scale, anyway, that's involved structural soil and flexible pavement, flexible pave. Is it? it I know it was a very unusual circumstance at, at, at War, Warfield, not your ordinary project because of all the uh, different people weighing in. Do you think we can anticipate we'll get this again, some more? Uh, will this become a practice that we can rely on to have structural soil and flexi pave? Uh, yes, I, I think that that has been in the last couple of paving contracts that we've had, but there hasn't been a call. There has been a call to use structural soil um, in um, what was it on on Main Street in Florence uh, with uh, not flexi pave as the actual sidewalk pavement. They used a flexi pave or permeable pavement around the tree wells. Yeah, um, and it's been in some of the other planning department uh, individual projects. For example, lower. Uh, Middle Pleasant Street, um, there's uh, sections of forest pavement there. Uh, I, I think probably what you're gonna see is um, obviously a, a, long, a long look at, at the uh, public outreach and the design process about road reconstruction and taking into account all of the assets, all the utilities, the assets, including the trees, the curbing. Um, and I think we will probably see um, you know, a slightly different approach to uh, paving projects. I think you're probably also going to see more of a uh, retrofit because we are, you know, in essence, we have planted a lot of trees on a lot of streets that we've been on that need to be reconstructed. The sidewalks are poor, they're narrow. So there has to be um, flexibility when it comes to doing a retrofit for CU soil. I mean, that's what we did that's what they did on the the dog leg of warfield is they they did uh soil um um retrofits around the ginkgo trees so they're cu soil so the ginkgo roots would eventually instead of trying to just root right in the tree belt they'll be able to go underneath the sidewalk without doing any damage so i think you're going to see more retrofitting around existing public shade trees um than the type of um situation that happened on warfield place um you know, the, the, one of the problems that exists, though, is that the complete streets ordinance that we have, you know, clearly requires us to have two ADA compliant sidewalks on both sides of the street. Hmm. And uh, in, in many places, we 
have not designed things that way because it's nearly impossible. You basically would have to cut everything down and start over, or you'd have to move existing um, other other pieces of existing infrastructure. So I think that whole complete streets ordinance probably ought to be looked at as well. To hmm. Actually, I mean, complete streets is more like building um, like a super highway. Right. You know, to basically provide all new infrastructure on both sides of the street from the edge of the public right away to the edge of the public right away. And that includes new trees and everything else. But the problem is, is that it's not a reality. I, it, it doesn't work well in a city that's an older city like ours that has various street widths and competing, a lot of competing interests. So to answer your question in the long form, yes, Rob, I think we'll see more of that. It is part of the design, it is part of the contract process now um, for every road construction project that there is a, a linear feet of uh, porous pavement and there is a, a square foot um, matrices for CU soil. And then what happens is during the design process, those areas are identified and then they're quantified and then put into the contract. Fantastic, fantastic. What yeah, a big right. change that will make. Yes, and, and I, I agree. And, and then of course, the, the whole conversation about um, the Main Street redesign, which is going to be multiples of uh, CU soil or maybe silver cells in order to propagate the appropriate, um, you know, tree green space that's required. So that's a that's a whole nother topic in itself. But yeah, it's definitely uh, an industry standard that is is, um, is is making some traction here, which is great. Well, I, I hope that if the opportunity arises, that this commission can help promote um, uh, trees when they come in conflict with complete streets would be something to do. I'm sorry, Molly, you, were, you had your hand up when I spoke. Up. I have a question. Um, that flexi pave, um, when you use that, does it eliminate the problem of roots, you know, making the pavement unaccessible for wheelchairs? Uh, it, it, it does, and it works even better in conjunction with um, structural soil underneath it. Because if you don't use structure, you can use porous pave over um, like hard packed or processed gravel. But what happens is that the roots will still, they won't be able to, they really don't want to go through the process gravel. They will try to rise right up between okay. the top of the gravel compaction and the lower, the lower part of the, um, they'll go right here and the sidewalk. So the flexi pave gives mm -hmm. to the point um, until it won't be able to give any longer. So yes, it does. It, do, it works well, but it works much better with CU soil. Oh, so with the CU soil, it allows the roots to go down deeper so they don't, um, they don't disturb the sidewalk? Yeah, they, they just migrate right through the CU soil. They grow right oh. up. It's regular, um, I wouldn't say regular loam, but it's a regular growing medium. That would be great if we could use that all the time. Where there's sidewalk. Hopefully with the cultivars that are being chosen, we won't have problems like we're seeing with silver maples and other trees that were planted in the past. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a there's a, it's a it's a good point too. Actually, there's a balance of uh, trying to find. You know, the other thing too is that a lot of the cultivars we've been planting are now um, what 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 I consider a medium tree. So, like the um, Emerald City Tulip uh, is a tree that grows maybe 50 feet tall, instead of a tulip tree that we all know can grow 120 feet tall. So um, we're trying to also match the correct um, cultivar uh, with a location so that it doesn't become so large that it becomes a, um, a hazard mm -hmm. or creates another set of uh, risks for sidewalks and people tripping in uh, ADA compliance. Yes, Jen. So I just wanted to clarify uh, what Molly was asking about the tree roots. So, you know, the main, the main goal of using um, uh, the CU soil is to remove the inherent uh, like competition between compaction for pavement and access to tree roots. Because by code, you have to compact the soil underneath pavement to a certain PSI. Oh. And, that, and that is um, 
that is not conducive to tree roots. Like after you get like, I think it's 200 PSI, then mm -hmm. tree roots will kind of stop growing or so what they do then is the roots will go to the interface between underneath the mm -hmm. if you've ever like pulled up a piece of cement it's all like lumpy yeah. underneath so there's yeah. space and that's where the water is so that's why sidewalks hump up because it's you know that's just what's accessible like tree roots can't like go in certain places mm -hmm. so that that's the goal is you could still compact see the soil it forms like a lattice and it and it's um can be uh, compacted to the um, code for paving and then also um, tree roots can go th through it so they're not coming up in the interface. Right, right. Yeah. I mean regular soil is always better but if you have that conflict which we do in urban settings then it's a kind of a it's a solution. So. Yeah, it's a great win-win because you you meet the code for the sidewalk and you and the trees have a better chance. Right, because the code for the plan. sidewalk is always going to win. You know, <laughs> it has to. You know, so. And, and the one last thing to think about is that the the CU soil is in itself a growing medium, but but the the big point here is that it allows the roots to travel often into people's yards where there's an endless amount of nutrient. Well huge amount of nutrients. That's really where the, the, go, the gold is. All right, we're a couple minutes over. Does anyone else have any other comments or any questions? I'll be back with um, hopefully a, a more accurate finalized list at the next meeting. And in the interim, um, I'll work with Rob to try to get a species. Mitch, I have a quick question. Uh, question yes. about um, uh, public shade trees on school grounds. Uh, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if now would be an, a good time to talk about it, but there's a lot of support at Jackson Street for an ambitious tree planting program. And because there's a new cur curriculum director um, named Karen Antero and Tony, who's the maintenance guy, everybody mm -hmm. seems to be in support of more trees. So I think it's, I think it's a golden opportunity to plant at all the uh, uh, well, at all the elementary schools. Um, well, I, I, don't know, I, I don't know as much about the middle and high school, but. David, one thing I want to bring up, which I shared with Rich regarding yeah. planting at the elementary schools. Um, back in December, I went to Jackson Street School to mm -hmm. pick up my bib for the hot chocolate run. And I parked right in front of two trees that we planted there in 2016 as part of our Arbor Day uh, activities. We involved uh, teachers and children and um, and they've both been damaged one more than the other. I took a picture and Rich feels like it was probably from like a lawnmower. So yeah. I'm all in favor, believe me, of planting trees on the school property and involving students, but we have to make sure the maintenance people, um, I don't know if we can put little fences around them or something to protect them. It's really unfortunate to see because they, they seemed to be, over the years, they seemed to be doing well. Mm. Yeah, it's a good point about the maintenance. But uh, I guess what I'm saying is that if anybody on this uh, commission would like to be part of the effort of thinking thinking that through and, through and trying to make it happen, I'm, I would love any thoughts or support. Yes, sir. I would support you, David. <laughs> Great. Um, do they have a group or is there a person who's leading it or? Well, it's, it's a Karen, the curriculum director has convened a meeting with Tony and um, Chris Chamberlain. Rob introduced me to Chris. Chris has yeah. done a good job, uh, you know, getting Ginkgo started at Jackson. So it's right now it's the four of us, but I mean, the more the merrier. Yeah, you I, have a good group. Yeah, you do, and I and I think I'm all for it. The only the only thing is is that the trees, you know, the trees that are on school grounds are not protected public shade trees, so they are at the will of a um, mm -hmm. school department. They're actually at the will of the uh, the principal of each school is responsible for the grounds of the technically by law. Whatever happens on school grounds has to get 
by the principal. So we just, I think, have to make sure that wherever we decide to plant, everyone's in agreement that where the trees are planted, they will be safe from being damaged, um, like Marilyn spoke of. Um, because so would they have to pay for them? No. No. They, so they'd have to water them. I don't know if they, that's a whole, that's a conversation piece we'd have to, I guess, with the, with the school at the, at the time, you know. So, I mean, typically when, when we planted on school grounds in the past, we, we can access it, it's accessible to us, we will we'll water them. Because the school, there's only three people in the school grounds group, and during the summer months, all the teachers and students are gone. So that's really when the trees need most of the water. So if the school grounds crew is doing something else, then the trees will end up uh, not, they'll, they'll end up uh, suffering from. I, I think a lot of that work would fall to the different PTOs, I'm guessing. Volunteers who would step forward to do summer watering, for example, for the first two or three years. Yeah, I, I like this. Um, Okay, uh, moving us along to the STO subgroup discussion. So uh, David, uh, Sue and myself, we had a meeting with Carolyn Mish on the day after our last meeting, which was the 16th of um, December. Uh, and as Carolyn so eloquently said, uh, Carolyn said so eloquently in the meeting, she said, I can't remember what I did two weeks ago or what I talked about. So <laughs> I, I'm hoping that we, the three of us can convey to the rest of the commission um, our meeting and what we talked about. Um, and if it's okay with David and Sue, what I'd like to do is I'd like to just quickly share, do a screen share of the tree zones. Um, so as all of the commissioners know, we've been kind of tinkering around with the STO and trying to tighten it um, to uh, reduce the DBH. Uh, the existing DBH is 20 inches of trees that can uh, that are protected during projects that actually have that are under site plan review or special permit review by the planning board. Um, this does not include trees that are um, that are protected in essence by right construction, which would be if any one of us wanted to go build an addition on our house or um, build a, a new house on a pre-existing lot uh, or a lot that is now. Um, now conforming to the new zoning ordinances, those are all by right construction. So the STO just applies, which I think is a big confusion point for a lot of people in the city. They don't understand why the STO just protects the trees and why individual developers cannot, uh, you know, don't have to abide by the STO. So in order to make the STO a little tighter um, and kind of streamline it and make it a little more Towards industry standards about inventory, we, we did a, we, we, re, we uh, revamped it with some suggestions and we sent it to the um, planning and uh, planning sustainability office. So I'm going to do a screen share, I think, let's see if I can get this right again, of what they, let's see. Okay. All right. So just move you all over here so I can see you. Okay. Yes. So here is, so we originally made a whole bunch of changes um, and uh, not a whole bunch of changes, but we made practical changes uh, to the STO that were in a draft form that Carolyn and Wayne and I reviewed um, back in the summer. Uh, Carolyn and Wayne were, um, fine with, I think, all of the changes um, to the STO uh, based around industry standards, inventory, uh, streamlining it to make sure that it actually um, made a little more sense. Um, and then, of course, the sticking point, which we kind of all knew, would be the, um, you know, the DBH, um, the changes in the DBH. We originally suggested we would like to see it reduced to 10 inches citywide. Um, and then um, they molded over and they came back with this map that you see here, which basically um, has the different zoning districts um, 
that are colorized in the city and they have different um, zoning, uh, different DBH um, requirements for, for tree protection. And as you can see in the most heavily urban uh, zoned areas of the city, it's still 20 inches. Um, as you get farther out in the more rural or suburban areas of the city, it is reduced um, to 10 inches and then finally to six inches. So, um, you know, their, their reasoning for this is that they want to, you know, continue to encourage um, smart development in already uh, existing urban um, areas where they're hoping that people will, uh, there'll be, you know, lar not larger developments, but more development that people can uh, walk uh, to the central part of the city. They can walk to places they need to get to. Um, they can ride their bikes. Um, that way their car stays home. Um, and then also by doing this, by having the sliding scale, it would prevent development in places that are, um, you know, the um, planning, the planning board does not want the city to be developed, which is out in the outer areas of the city. So for example, up here in Leeds, it's six inches, it's 10 inches out here in the, in the northwestern uh, part of the city. Um, it's 10 inches um, down here in, um, which would be the south, uh, the south um, western part of the city. And then of course, all through the meadows, uh, the meadows area um, into the oxbow is all six inches, but maintaining the 20 inch DVH replacement area in this uh, unshaded area. So, you know, I mean, we all, we had a lot of good questions and I, I will defer to David and Sue if they would like to speak because you both actually asked a lot of good questions at the meeting. If you remember what you had, if you remember what we talked about, um, either one of you can go if you'd like. Uh, Rich, that was a good summary, and it was a long time ago. Uh, I think we talked a bit about process, um, like it, uh, asking Carol and candidly, let's say we adopted your, uh, your your different threshold model, what's the best way to get it passed? And she said, well, uh, really, you should get the support of the city council. So I think the idea is to present this 6, 10, 20, revision to the city council and kind of kick off a hearing and the well, one thought is that it it's anybody's guess what what the public might choose to focus on during those hearings but there might really be a groundswell for an even more restrictive ordinance um, so that was one thought so um am i right to in recollection that we were gonna that there should be a letter a joint letter that would be from Wayne um, and Donna, um, I forget who else, to the city council saying we would like a hearing. Is that how it went, the process? Like what are the details of the process? So, so I think the details of the process would be first and foremost, the commission has to endorse this, um, you know, the, the changes to the SDO. Um, and this zoning map change. Uh, and then if that was the case, then we would, uh, we would have, I would, I would strongly suggest that we actually talk to the mayor because okay. this, this ordinance um, upon, okay. upon recommendation of the uh, Department of Planning Sustainability and the mayor and the city's Urban Forestry Commission, we hereby request a change to uh, you know, um, zoning ordinance uh, 350, I think it's dash, or 350 dash 1.2, which is where this ordinance lives. And then that would get introduced to city council and then it would get referred to, um, it would get referred to council, uh, to uh, um, a council committee. And then that's where it would go to, to a hearing process. Um, I think when, um, my question would be to the mayor, I guess would be how, 
you know, who is going to be responsible for conveying this information to the individual counselors. Typically in the past, um, Mayor Narkowitz is the one that's, uh, or someone from Mayor Narkowitz's office has been the point person to communicate with the counselors because of that separation of uh, executive branch and legislative branch. Um, however, I don't, I don't have a, um, I don't know um, how the new mayor would like to operate. Um, so I think it's really best to have her opinion on this. Uh, if she doesn't support this change, then we're kind of, we're stuck because we advise the mayor. Although we could actually speak to other city councilors if we are given permission to do so, I guess, considering the, tenu the tenuous nature this might um, drum up with folks. But, you know, th th does it work? Does Donna talk to the mayor? Is that like, well, first step is that we would say we agree, we want to move forward with this. And then be Donna would talk to the mayor or? No, I, I think what I would do is I would actually request a meeting uh, with Wayne, Carolyn and the mayor to, to, have a, to have a departmental discussion about this because our departments will be the ones that are gonna be implementing this um, or um, you know, managing this change. Um, and how about, you know, does the mayor support this and the mayor is gonna ask us why we want these changes. And so there has to be representation on both sides because really we're, I think we're, we're, we're we, the reality is, is that we have to compromise um, with, the, with planning and sustainability and planning sustainability realizes they have to compromise with uh, folks that are um, wanting to protect trees and that, you know, namely us, but other residents, you know, and this is just one piece of the tree protection puzzle that I think there's a much longer game that we have to discuss at length at some other time, but not tonight, but um, because there's a lot of trees that are being removed that are not underneath the STO by right that we don't have, we, we can't quantify. We don't know how many are being removed. We don't know uh, this, the, um, how it's affected our canopy since the inception of the, uh, the different, the infill development of zoning, which is all by right. So, so I, I think that I would probably suggest that we um, have a, have a, a, an internal meeting to talk to the mayor and probably Donna would be present there as well. You know, I would probably brief Donna, but I don't think Donna's, Donna would be interested in how this all operates, but I think really this is a, a mayoral decision to either support this or not support this. You know, the mayor could say to, the mayor could say to Wayne and Carolyn that, you know, I actually would like it to be 10 inches across the whole city. You know, I have, I have absolutely no idea. I'm just being, saying that hypothetically, I'm, I don't know that for a fact, but, or she could say, I don't want to change it at all. I don't support any changes. We don't know until we ask. So that's kind of how the process would work. Um, you know, I, I have the, uh, the draft change, the, the actual draft document we worked on. I gave that to Wayne and Carolyn. They sent it back as, in the track changes form. So I'd like to share that with all of you so you can look at it. Um, I'll send it to you in an email so you can actually look at it at your, on your own time, um, or we can go over it now if you would like. It's a quarter of, so I, I'll leave that up to you, but I don't know if, if um, um, David or Sue, if you have anything else you want to add about our meeting with Carolyn. Um, not really. I mean, this is just the STO, it only affects like a small percentage of trees. So I don't know. Rich, are you happy with enforcing this? Because you'd be the enforcer. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm happy. I'm happy with this um, because at least it captures in certain sections of the city. Um, you know, it captures a tree inventory. If someone like in the upper in the upper leaves area wanted to do development, we would see all the six inch trees and greater that would be gone or maybe preserved. Um, but right now, you know, that six to 20 inch DVH doesn't exist. It's just cut down and we have no, we have no way of tracking it. Um, you know, one of the things that I remember Sue asking Carolyn was, about how, you know, is there a way to actually track, and this is, Again, broadening the horizon, the blanket much bigger than the STO. Is there a way to track 
all of the trees that are taken down um, during construction projects. And that would include things that are done by right uh, and things that are in the STO. And Carolyn said, yes, that you could do that, but it would be, um, it would be a huge lift to manage all the data and track all the data. Uh, and it would require the building department to actually uh, have some kind of tracking software or have some kind of documents in their uh, application packet for a building permit. You know, if you wanted to install a swimming pool or if you wanted to put solar panels on your roof, or if you wanted to build an addition, the building department would have to have a little line in there and say, well, how many trees do you plan on cutting down? And then you'd have to go by the honor system to have, make sure the applicant or the contractor actually tagged the amount of trees. Um, but I think data, I think data is important. Um, out of that meeting, what I, got, what I really got was the fact that I think we need to keep moving with the STO and try to move it forward and have the, make the changes that we have in front of us uh, happen. But we also need to have a really deep dive conversation about the rest of the trees that are in the city's urban forest, which is everything, not just the trees that we're responsible for managing, but all the trees. And, um, you know, we, we, don't really, we don't really know how many trees have been lost since they have changed the zoning ordinance back in 2015. We have no idea. We only know how many trees were, were we only know how many trees were lost to a certain degree by the STO. But I think there we need to understand before we talk about any type of larger zoning footprint, we need to know the amount of trees that have been lost. And that's a data collection point. We have to figure out how to get there. And what about LIDAR? Carolyn said it's ridiculously expensive. It's like out of the question, basically. But um, we is. have an old LIDAR. If sometime we could plan to have a new LIDAR, then we could have an argument that like things have been changing and which I'm sure they have. Now, does anybody know, Molly, do you know how LIDAR works? And it... um. Not exactly. All I know is I think it picks up um, very subtle elevation dis differences. Like you can see stone walls with it, but I don't, besides that, I don't really know how it works or anything. Because this data collection seems like it, it's unrealistic. But just my last two cents is that this is moving in the direction for one small segment of trees. So it's something. I, I, I agree with Sue. I, I think it is. I, I think, um, although I think more can be done, but I, I, I don't know if necessarily. So it's really about a balancing act. So we can't, you know, you can't penalize one group of people to, a, to an extreme um, to try to save every single tree that's being removed in the city, you have to have a balancing act across the city. Um, and that means that actually looking at possibly how to capture data from trees that are removed that are not part of the STO and actually analyzing the data and then determining really how much of a problem we really have. Do we really have a problem with trees being removed by right for these new um, infill uh, individual homes? Our, our uh, two family homes or do we not have a problem? And we don't, we won't know that until we have that kind of data, but for the short term, I think moving this forward would be um, in the right direction as Sue just alluded. I have a, a question just procedurally about this commission and you know, benefiting from the valuable feedback of, of Rob and Jen and, and Molly and Marilyn, uh, should we discuss and, and vote on some kind of um, amendment before? You take it to Donna and the mayor, or so, would that be a good idea? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I think what I, I think what we should do is I want to send you this map, and I want to send you the actual uh, track changes document, and I would like all of you to look at it carefully, um, and then we can reconvene at our next meeting and have a, a I'll leave another discussion time for this. So that way there you can That's look good. Yeah. Up and then have you have any questions, you can generate them in between now and then. Um, and then we can figure out how you want to move forward from there, you know. 
I think that's the best way to do it. I mean, I, I think that the, as far as the subgroup goes, and I'm speaking just for myself, but I think we are at our limit of, um, the, you know, we are, we've ex, we're at our, our ceiling. We can't discuss it anymore as a subgroup. If we, we want to bring this to the whole commission and ask the commission if they want to move it forward. So I'll give you this data and the other um, draft track changes document, and then the commission can review it and we can talk uh, in open meeting um, in the middle of the month, if you're okay with all that. Um, just so you know, I will be away from this Sunday through the 18th. So you won't be at our next meeting? Um, our next meeting? Uh... No, I'll be at the next meeting because that's after that. Okay. All right. Let me, uh... But I wouldn't be like um, if you called a meeting in between to talk about the STO. Uh, no, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. Do, I, I'm not gonna do that. No, it would be the the meeting would be on the our next meeting is the nineteenth. Yeah, I'll be here for that. Okay. If my it's a matter of canceled. reading it, so we can have a discussion and perhaps vote, so we can have a voice as one body. And I mean, I don't feel like. I mean, I also don't want the commission to feel like there's pressure if you have a bunch of questions. We don't have to vote at the next meeting. We can have a discussion about it, try to resolve the questions. And if we have to go back to Wayne or Carolyn with to get answers, then we we can we can certainly do that. You know, I'd like to do this, I'd like to do this, um, I'd like to do it right and do it once and then have to backtrack and do it again. Um, mm -hmm. but I think having I think having Wayne again, I'll just leave it with this, having Wayne and Carolyn. Um, and planning as part of uh, this process has been very helpful. I learned a lot, um, and I think that we, we would not be able to move this forward without their support. I think it would be a pretty a kind of a heavy lift to try to um, just do it on our own and, and force it, in, in essence. Anybody well, else? And, and one of our big goals, as I see it over time, has been to try to develop a closer relationship with the planning commission and sustainability and all these other, you know, places that we really didn't have any kind of ongoing communication with. And, you know, these kind of like, uh, you know, subcommittee meetings with them and keeping, you know, listen to them, they put something, we compromise, they compromise. You know, I think that's all super important to maintaining in the long run a culture that they will come to us and we can come to them, you know, for other things. So I think, that this, you know, we're not going to get everything we want, but probably. But I appreciate David and Sue and Rich's, you know, efforts in this department. It's, it's big, you know, it's onerous and slow, you know, but it's... Yeah. I forgot about that. It's yeah. it has improved. Yeah. Oh, way. I mean, yeah, it was non-existent. Yeah. We we were having all these people come to our meetings originally. Right. You know, in the beginning. You know, so just to say, hey, you know, here we are. Wow. Here you are. You know. I also want to give a quick shout out to Christina Peterson. I know she's not here, but Christina was very helpful in the uh, beginning of the drafting of the changes to the SDO. So when we were, um, yeah, so I want to say thank you to her as well. So, so I, I have, uh, I'll get this document to you and I'll get the, um, the track changes document that Carolyn and Wayne sent back to me. If no one else has any questions, I'd like to move on. We have a short window of time left. Molly, I, I put you on spotter lantern fly update. I didn't know if you had anything, I wasn't sure. Yeah, I have a little bit. Um, okay. Thank you. I've, I've found out that it is possible to identify these trees in the winter. And I went out the other day and um, I found some more, two more big ones. And they were in this little section of woods um, close to that big one that's in the right of way on um, North Maple, not North Maple, Maple Street in Florence, the one where you're going down the hill toward Nonatuck. If you're, if you're going down that hill, and uh, you look to the right um, behind that, behind the houses on the right side of, not, of um, Maple, there's a little section of woods that, that's like 
overlooks um, Nonatuck and the um, that house, the um, what's that historical house, the um, David Marble Center. Yes, yes, it overlooks those houses, and um, there's a tree up there that's like 24 inches, and another one that's I think it was like 14 um, that belong to. Um, they belong to, I think they're actually both on the same lot. The house it's um when you're on Onanatuck, on the second one from the corner. Um, so anyway, I thought there might be more around there since the, that big one was there. And sure enough, I think these might have been the original ones. Anyway, um there's more searching to do, especially I think in areas that have um disturbed soil or like areas that had been like maybe around the old the quarry on Ryan Road, maybe or um more searching around king street and downtown um there's lots more to do um but it's pretty easy to identify them because um their bark they have thick twigs and then they have those um there's still some remaining um of the leaf um the center um ribs of the leaf are still attached um on some of the twigs up in the tree and you can see those, and then you can also tell it apart from black walnut because the bark is very is smooth instead of very rough. So, um, yeah, so it's kind of fun to go and look for them. Um, that's where I'm at right now. I haven't done any other tasks related to that. If there's anybody who's interested in helping look for those, let me know. I have a quick comment about. Um tree pruning this winter, which is that it is now being slowed by the surge of um, the COVID in that usually we work in pairs or even groups and kind of work closely together. Uh, previously, we felt okay working outside, but this is so contagious that working closely with people even outside, I don't really think it's advisable. And I've worked with other people, um, Bob Hack, beyond, you know, thinking about this. And so we are, we all will be out pruning, but it won't be the program and the educational program that we would have wanted. That's smart. It's a lot of sick people. Yeah. There are, there are a lot, there are a lot of sick people and it's really sad. So. Yeah, Cooley Dickinson's full and um, yep. highly communicable in a way that the other previous Variants were not, so you can get it pretty, uh, pretty easily. Katie told me that every single, she was at a meeting today. Every single hospital in Western Massachusetts is at it to max or above. Every Ooh. single one. Well, so we're not going to add yeah. to their their problems. And we're Good gonna... idea. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's it's a little sad for the program because you know we'd like to all get out together and work together and have an educational component and all that, but. That's it. Uh, before that we wrap up, up again. Um, Rich, I just have two yes. quick questions. Yes, Marilyn. Uh, is the mayor going, the new mayor, um, has anybody reached out to her to invite her to a meeting? And um, my second no, not, question. No, not yet, is, sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm sure she's got a lot <laughs> going on as she gets going. Um, is is there anything further on the main street redesign any any progress or any, anything to report no 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 other than i had a conversation with the uh the individual um the tool design about the plowing of main street and um basically i i needed to hope they were asking about the plowing and how to plow main street with the proposed new redesign mm. asked them a lot of questions about um, like raised structures, are there going to be raised tree planting wells? Are there going to oh. what entities are going to be there? And how are we going to get the snow from the front of the main street buildings to the street to remove it? And what obstacles? And of course, unfortunately, in the 25% design phase, they don't have all those other amenities like benches, trash cans, seating areas. Everything is more like in a proposed. They're focusing really now on uh, the infrastructure. Um, meaning the utilities, et cetera. Uh, so those will come later on. So I, I don't have any, I don't have any updates other than that, um, which is still not resolved. It's just like the points I sent them about.
about plowing because I plow Main Street and I plowed it for a long time. So I kind of understand how it works, but it'll be definitely different with more, more things there. So, but if I have information, I'll share it with you. Okay, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, does anyone else have anything not anticipated, any business anticipated by the chair? Yes, Molly. Just on the, um, the minutes, I, I think that they're carrying over our tasks each month because the list of tasks um, that are showing up on the minutes are old ones that, at least for me, a lot of those are out of date now. Right. I, I, I don't know. To me, it's not useful to have them in the minutes because it's hard to keep them updated. So then, Unless we go through each month and just say, okay, we did this, this, and this. We still have to do that, that, and that. Um, that's a good point. And I think, correct me, folks, if, if I'm wrong, but I think we decided not to go over the to-do list. Right. We also discussed not having it on the minutes. We were just going to keep it as a document that lived in the drive. Right. We just... As we're given tasks or we are assigned to a certain particular project, we just put our task in there. And it really was more of a tracking mechanism for ourselves. Yeah. Not, not for the commissioners to kind of uh, get after other commissioners, to get something done in essence. Not, not we were going to use the, um, the spreadsheets that had all of our different projects on it. Yes. Um, and each person was going to kind of record, you know, where they're at on those individual pages. Yeah. So, so Deb, you don't you don't have to uh, you don't have to put the to do list on the minutes any longer. Okay, I'll remove them completely, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, anything else? Any other items? Not anticipated by the chair. Okay, so everyone will be here for our next meeting. You think so? Uh, we can. I'll make sure the STO is on the. I'll, I'll send you an agenda update. And if anyone has anything they want to talk about, please let me know. So other than that, uh, we have a motion to adjourn. Okay, I'll do it. Okay, <laughs> when everyone oh. joins once. Uh, Molly, <laughs> Molly B. Jen, I think we'll, we'll I'll soon. second. All right. Um, all, uh, any discussion on the motion? Uh, there being no discussion, uh, all in favor, just a hand raise would be fine. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Meeting is adjourned. <laughs>